This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dee Dee Sharp and welcome to this special edition of The Aware Show. We're glad to have you right there. I'm so honored to be welcoming back a very special guest, Mr. Leonard Pitts Jr. A very special guest for us here on AWARE. Mr. Pitts appeared on AWARE a few years ago during his book tour and at that time my dearest friend Robert Richard was filling in for me and had the opportunity to do an interview with him and now it's my turn and I'm so excited. Mr. Pitts has won numerous awards for literary excellence. His career spans more than 35 years. He's been a columnist, a college professor, a radio producer, a novelist, and a lecturer, just to name a few. But if you ask him to define himself, he'll actually tell you he's a writer. His awards are too numerous to name, and it would take up most of our interview to go on and on and on about it, but I do have to share some highlights with you. His extraordinary newspaper career began at the Miami Herald critiquing music, and in a few short years, he received his own column where he dealt with race, politics, and culture from a pro progressive perspective. Well, today his column is syndicated in more than 250 newspapers. Pitts gained national recognition for his widely circulated column of September 12, 2001, titled, We'll Go Forward From This Moment, in which he described the toughest of the American spirit in the face of the September 11th attacks. In 2004, Mr. Pitts received the coveted Pulitzer Prize for Commentary. He is a three-time recipient of the National Association of Black Journalists Award of Excellence. And in 2008, he was chosen as NABJ's Journalist of the Year. He has received critical acclaim for his books, including his latest book, Grant Park, in which we'll talk about on this show. I could go on and on and on on his list of accomplishments as if I didn't. <laughs> those, just, those are just some things you just have to talk about when you talk about Leonard Pitts Jr. Okay. Here All on right. The Aware Show. Oh, if you say so. All right. <laughs> We're so glad to have you here. Thank you. Good to be here. I know. Here. You probably are like many people who just... Don't like to hear all these wonderful accomplishments and things that you've bit. done. Yeah, I, I get a little sick of hearing <laughs> myself, but okay. I'm sick of myself already. Yes. But those are just some of the things, the accomplishments that, you know, being a journalist myself, mm -hmm. we're excited about because those are things to be celebrated, as I mentioned well, in our you. open. Congratulations thank on you. all of that good stuff. Thank you. We're going to get to some nitty gritty, as you do in your columns. Okay. I want to talk a little bit about, um, I hate to start from the basics, but if people miss that original AWARE show, mm -hmm with Robin, then they probably miss a little of your background and how you got started. Okay. So I'll just get you started uh, by moving along a little bit here. One of your very first interviews with, mm -hmm. was with one of my favorite uh, musical artists, Denise Williams. Yeah. And, and, and that was like her first coming on the scene and kind of your first. Tell us yeah, about that. I, I think it was, I know it was my, it was my first getting paid for. I'd done one on, on what they call spec, which is you do the interview and maybe somebody will pay you for it. But Denise was the first person I'd ever been assigned to do. And I'm pretty sure that I was, if not the very first, one of the very first people that ever interviewed her. This is right before her first album. Uh, this is Nisi, her first really like hit album. This is Nisi came out. And I just remember, you know, <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing. I don't know if she had a lot of experience at it. So we just sat and chatted, you know, for about 45 minutes in the offices of Soul Magazine in L.A. and talked about her kids and, 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 and you know, her career and the whole deal. And just had a lot of fun. That was yeah. some of your bigger moments, I guess, in, in doing music critiquing, but it certainly wasn't your cha most challenging you tell us about uh, doing your music critiques for the Miami Herald when you first started off. Well, I was a music critic for 15 years, and then I came to the Herald in 91, which is actually the last place I worked as a music critic. And the thing about doing uh, music for a daily uh, newspaper as opposed to, say, doing it you know, for a magazine, for specialty magazine, is that uh, you, um, you have to do some of everybody. So I literally went from Public Enemy to Dolly Parton to Frank Sinatra, you know, mm -hmm. to U2, to, you know, the OJs on any, on any given night, to, to, to Snoop Dogg or whomever. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was, a lot of, there was a lot of challenge in just being able to be very flexible and perhaps get into some music that's not your natural, you know, mm -hmm. not something that you would naturally gravitate to. And what I, you know, you, you discover things that way too. 
you discover stuff that, oh, I didn't know I liked that. I wouldn't, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I would have done that a lot. That's all right, days. you know. <laughs> yeah. That kind of thing. But you also discover what you do like and the old yeah. stuff that you really loved. Yeah, well, what I discovered, you know, or, or reaffirmed for myself in popular music, and it's one of the reasons I stopped doing it when I did, was that I like music to have, you know, to have some soul. And when I say soul, I'm not talking about R&B, black music necessarily. I'm talking about some grit, some humanity, some, you know, sure. some heartbeat in it. Right. And uh, what I f was finding uh, by the time I quit, and certainly a lot of stuff I listen to now, there's a lot of very shiny production and a lot of, you know, cut and paste grooves and everything, but in terms of being able to find a heartbeat in there, oftentimes you, you come up short. So, you know, that's what, that's what I tend, that's what I found that I value in music. Just show me that this comes from a human being who, who's coming from someplace. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, and that is so expressed yeah. in your writing as well, a journalist. Uh, and we'll get to some of that in just a moment as we go in depth with Grant Park. Okay. But I just want to kind of stay here a little bit mm -hmm. and simmer this because um, you're being a columnist and a music critic. Mm -hmm led to some bigger opportunities for you and ultimately what you're doing now and what you've probably always wanted to do. Tell well, the, the music criticism, as I said, by the time I came to the Herald, I've been doing it for uh, 15 years and uh, it reached a point where I just said this, you know, as I said a moment ago, this, this music isn't speaking to me right. anymore. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, I, I'm Snoop Dogg is not talking to me. <laughs> He's right. talking to my kids, but he doesn't really have a lot to say to me. And uh, I decided that I wanted to, you know, try to do something, uh, you know, something else, which is what led me to go into my editor's office one day. And you know, it seems it, it, I, I marvel now at, at the the chutzpah that I had then, because I didn't even think about it then. It's like, you know, basically I'm saying, you know, you hired me to do this, but I don't want to do it anymore. How about you just give me a column, mm. <laughs> you know, and I write about whatever I want to write about, mm -hmm. you know, and instead of kicking me out of the uh, office and saying, you better take your so and so down to that new kids on the block interview <laughs> and, and be happy with it, you know, he, they they said you. okay. They said, okay, which much is where, to your which is where the, yeah, much to my surprise, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's where this column comes from, from mm -hmm. me just reaching a point of saying, you know, I'm not feeling it as much with the music now. This is 1994 we're talking about. I'm not feeling it in 1994 the way I felt it in 1976. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, and then that led us to ultimately where we are to some degree now as yeah. you being a novelist. That led to the column. The, I, I've been writing novels. People ask me, why did you decide to write a novel? My first novel was published in 2009. Why did you decide to start writing novels then? I tell them, I've been writing novels since I came out of college. <laughs> wow. This is the first time somebody, <laughs> you published. I wrote somebody something, to look somebody at decided, okay, <laughs> okay, this doesn't stink, we'll publish it. You know, mm -hmm. it, took me a, it took me a while to learn how to write a novel that somebody wanted to publish, which is why I always tell people I, I have a certain amount of antipathy toward, you know, 21-year-old published novelists. I just, you know... Mm -hmm. How did you do that? You yes. know. Yes. Yes. But uh, you know. But you know. All, all joking aside, it, it, it took a while. But I, I believe in knowing what you're put here to do, and that's always something that I felt that I was put here to do. So I, I never really stopped, um, you know, working toward that, uh, working toward that goal, and finally hit it in '09. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry, I'm kind of leaning into your shot. It's kind of like me leaning into the interview too. <laughs> okay. But I do want to go according to some of the mm -hmm. notes here that I have for you mm -hmm. because. Um, Oh, we got notes. Oh, oh this, yeah, this, I did. This is about to be good. Let me let me tell you why mm -hmm. I have notes okay. like this on you. Um, I do do this for guests, just for mm -hmm. prepping for shows. Mm -hmm. But you know, I'm a journalist myself mm -hmm. after 25 years in news and mm -hmm. radio mm -hmm. and, and television. And so, when you meet somebody like you and mm -hmm. you see your work, mm -hmm. I um, can so appreciate mm -hmm. how you write. Oh, it thank is you. there is some wordsmithing going on here with with what you're doing and how you relay the message. Thank you. And um, and I think as people as we're going to go into and dive into Grant Park, mm -hmm. I think when they pick up the book and they begin to read it, not that I'm trying to sell them the book. No, please sell them <laughs> the book. <laughs> but I think when they begin to read what I'm you know, they'll hear. I'll try to mm -hmm. relay a little bit of, of it here on the show mm -hmm. uh, for them and lay it out. Uh, one of the reasons why you're here is because you lecture. You're very popular with right. that. People love to hear you because you talk about a number of various mm -hmm. issues and you also do in, in your writing as well. So um, just kind of diving into, keep talking about Grant Park. Mm -hmm. You've written several books. Right. Grant Park seems to have captured the essence of even what we're dealing with right now. Um, you've talked before probably about such issues as Ferguson, Baltimore. Mm -hmm. Now we're dealing with Charlottesville, Virginia, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. 
as I was reading this, I couldn't believe Charlottesville was unfolding as I was turning I mean, the pages. Part, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tell yeah. us a little bit about that. Well, it's funny. I, when I wrote the book, uh, which is about race and politics in the Obama era um, and the assassination of Martin Luther King, I, I had a feeling that it was going to be a very timely book. But it seems to have become even more timely yes. <laughs> since it came out. It came out in, uh, in 2015. Uh, and it has just become more timely as we have seen these issues of, of, of race uh, just become more in, in your face, more, more difficult to ignore. We spend, you know, they've always been there, but a lot of us have spent a lot of time sort of ignoring or pretending mm -hmm. that things weren't as they were. And while we've been ignoring, things have just been getting worse and, and certain people have becoming, been, been becoming more brazen and more out there, feeling basically encouraged or ratified in, in their views. And all of a sudden we have something like, uh, like, like Charlottesville, we have something like, um, the, uh, like the Charleston Church Massacre. We have, these, you know, we, we have these really awful things going on, but the seeds for those have been festering for a lot of years. It's just that we chose, we chose to, uh, to, to not pay attention to them. Mm -hmm. And the way you were able to weave the tapestry mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. two men's lives in this book, mm -hmm. it is um, the life of one uh, black man who mm -hmm. is an accomplished journalist mm -hmm and a white man who is his editor. Right. Uh, and so the story is told from so many different perspectives. You right. just, it just seems to go on and on and on because mm -hmm. even within those two people are so many other things going on. Can you right. tell us a little bit about, without me telling the story? <laughs> well, we're looking at Bob, who's the white guy, and, and Malcolm, who's, the, who's, who's his, um, the black columnist for the Chicago paper. We're looking at them in two different uh, periods of their lives. We're looking at Bob and Malcolm in 19, uh, 68, when um, Malcolm is this sort of, you know, fiery, what they would have called then a black militant, you know, angry, you know, guy in, in, involved in, in, in the, um, the uh, protests in 1968 in Memphis for the sanitation uh, worker strike that ultimately cost Dr. King his life. And Malcolm, I mean, Bob at the same time is this idealistic white kid who's, you know, in, in love with the idea of, of protesting for civil rights and also in love with this black girl named Janika Lattimore who just flips his beanie, you know, <laughs> upside down and then dumps him, which he's been, which he's been feeling some kind of way about for 40 years. And then we also see them in 2008 uh, on the eve of uh, the election of Barack Obama. Uh, where they become two completely uh, kind of different guys, where Bob is sort of this guy who's become closed off to uh, the idealism he once felt. He's uh, he's not he's you know he 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 almost thinks that he's become that he's become a racist. What he's actually become is a guy who's got what I call compassion fatigue. You know he's he's been he's been dealing with this. He's been hearing you you know black folk complaining about this that and the other for so many years, and he's like you know he's 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 full up. Mm -hmm. uh, and and he, and he's he's kind of angry. He doesn't like this about himself. Malcolm, on the other hand, has become this guy who's just given up. He's just, uh, you know, he he writes a he writes a column. As a matter of fact, in the book where he says that he's given up on white people, uh, and you know, he's given up on the idea that that this country can ever really change. And so they they go through some stuff and some things, especially in the uh, the 2008 um, chapters of the book, that sort of challenge all of their preconceptions and all of the. All, all of our preconceptions, I hope, if I've done it right. You've reached, uh, I yeah. think, uh, a lot of different areas here. Mm. Yes, racism. Mm. Um, yes, um, you've got the black mm. on white love relationship mm. that has gone on back in the 60s. Mm. You bring it back to mm. today, mm. Uh, more or less. You're talking about the father of Malcolm right. and the issues that they had, father and mm. son. You're talking about Bob and the issues that he's probably still dealing with mm. uh, from back in the 60s. Right. And, and even today struggling as a white man trying to just do the right thing but yeah. just tired of hearing you know like mm -hmm. you said mm -hmm. the, the same old black what card is this being played racism stuff I'm, <laughs> I'm tired sick of, of this. yeah I'm sick of hearing this yeah and so you you I love it because mm -hmm. then Malcolm is um is kidnapped by two races yeah he's kidnapped by two white supremacists <laughs> who have a plan to assassinate uh the incoming President Obama, and it's this really bizarre and ridiculous plot, but what a lot of people don't know, unless they've read the uh, the section at the very end of the book, the acknowledgement section, the plot is bizarre, but it's based on a real plot. <laughs> you know, it's that that some folks actually did a lot of this stuff, mm -hmm. uh, planning to kill uh, Obama actually on, um, my book takes place on Election Day, this was supposed to have taken place on Inauguration Day. And it just sort of, you know, it sort of prefigures how crazed and how outlandish and how brazen uh, this whole racial thing 
was becoming then and has become even since then. Uh, that you know, we, we, we keep fooling ourselves into believing that we have overcome and that we have reached the promised land. And every time we as Americans buy into that lie, it seems like something happens to, uh, to, to, to prove us wrong. You know, there's, after Obama was elected, a lot of people were talking about, well, have we reached a post-racial America? And I've been telling them, no, we, we now live in the most racial America since the 1950s or 60s, mm. you know? Interesting, yeah. and interesting enough, too, that in the book mm -hmm. and in one of your columns, uh -huh. <laughs> you talk about Martin Luther King Jr., mm -hmm. and you talk about Barack Obama, and that's the thing that I love about this, is you, you weave the 60s and Martin Luther King, and mm -hmm. then you bring it to date right. with Obama in 2008, 40 years later. But here at the beginning of this column, you pull out something that you had from the book. Two um, things that each of them said, and here's what you say in the yeah. column. It's entitled Leonard Pitts Jr., Our S United States Are Anything But. Mm -hmm. You started off by saying, well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead. That's Martin Luther King Jr., right. April 3rd, 1968. But what we know, what we have seen, is that America can change. That's yeah. Barack Obama, March 18th, 2008. Right. So, I don't know how you were able to use the historical past of Martin Luther King and, and basically, I guess, the historical mm -hmm. of the future with Barack Obama mm -hmm. to kind of be the basis of, of this book. Well, I liked those two quotes because it was almost like Barack Obama was finishing Martin Luther King's thought. Okay. You know, I, I, really, li I really like juxtaposing those two. Uh, and again, even, even with that in mind, if you look, you know, that was what uh, Obama said in 2008, which is nine years ago. If you look where we've become, where we've come since then, yeah, America can change, but it's not always going to change in ways that are, right. you know, nice. And not always going not always to change in ways that, that we would like to see it change. So, you know, it, it's, it's sort of this, this yin and yang, this, this sort of glass half full, glass half empty. Uh, kind of thing that's going on between the two of them. One of the things that I like about Obama and that, and that frustrates me about Obama at the same time is this endless optimism, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and this, this, this refusal sometimes to just say, you know, that just, just say it is what it is. Uh, and it, I remember uh, when a lot of us, and I was prominent in this, we're, we're saying that Obama needs to at some point just acknowledge that a lot of the, the the extreme response to him has to do with not not with policy, has to do with the color of his skin, and the way he routinely responded to that was saying, "Well, yeah, there's a lot of people who don't like me because I'm black, but there's probably a few more who voted for me because you know for that same reason." You sound just like him. Oh God, no, just kidding. Help me. <laughs> and I remember <laughs> I, I remember him. that because one of his friends, this white guy, <laughs> told him, "No, Barack, you know, there's a lot of people who don't like you because you and because you're black." And Obama didn't want to really deal with this, but it's like, okay, look. Mr. President, I almost said, dude, look, Mr. President, if this white guy, you know, can see it, you need to see it. You need to be able to see this and, and, and own up to it because the fact that this exists says something very real about where we are and where we are not as Americans. Yeah. And see, that's that thing I'm talking about. Yeah. You just did it. <laughs> what? what? What thing did I just do? I'm that sorry. word smithing. Oh. You get ready to start weaving them up together <laughs> on in there. And I love it. I Give love me it a computer. A lot. I'll be <laughs> I'll, You'll I'll, go at it. Yeah, I believe yeah, you will. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. With um, yeah. just just a few more minutes here mm -hmm. on Grant Park because it deserves it. Okay. Um, when we talk about Bob, mm -hmm. the white guy, for mm -hmm. other just so that you'll know who I'm talking about, mm -hmm. and we talk about Malcolm, the mm -hmm. black guy who, who's in here. Mm -hmm. Which one did you find to be probably the most difficult to write about? Uh, the the black journalist who I kind of saw as you the accomplished black journalist or mm -hmm. the white guy who can see where Malcolm's coming from, but he's just over it already. I didn't find either one of them particularly difficult to write. Okay. Uh, I found them both, you know, maybe because I know these guys, you know. I've, I've the known, attitudes for yeah, sure, I've right? Yeah, I've known these guys, you know, I've, I've received emails from I don't know how many Bobs, <laughs> 1,000 Bobs over the years, <laughs> you know. Uh, there's some, there's some Malcolm in me, although I would never go to the extremes that Malcolm, you know, does. He went so far extreme that he, his name, mm -hmm. Malcolm Toussaint, comes mm -hmm. from Malcolm X, yeah, he Marcus went, Garvey. Malcolm, Malcolm went way, way left. <laughs> he, way, way. You know, and, you know, I, I'm not going there, Malcolm. Yeah. I, I enjoy my career, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and, and I couldn't yeah. help but, as yeah. reading it, wondering, was that you in some way? And if you, no. the reason why I'm saying that, hear, hear me now, okay. is because 
I felt like as a journalist, mm -hmm. we always have to straddle the fence mm -hmm. of being um, completely objective. Mm -hmm. You have to tell both sides. Mm -hmm. That's what's fair, right? But when you're writing the novels and doing your mm -hmm. even your columns, you kind of have the opportunity to be more subjective. You get to, well, because I, I write opinion, I get to be subjective yeah, all the time, to, yeah. but, I know, but I know what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, Malcolm, I have Malcolm's frustrations. Matter of fact, there, in the book, there's a uh, there's a um, uh, email, a hate mail from a, from a reader that sets Malcolm off, and every word of that email is sort of it's an it's an amalgamation of emails that I've received over the years. So every word of that email <laughs> came from someplace. I didn't I didn't quote unquote Put it write all any, yeah I didn't write any of that. That's just a lot of stuff that's been in my head. So I have a lot of the frustrations that Malcolm has that caused him to do what he did. Mm -hmm. The thing that Malcolm does that I would uh, hope I would never do is, as I say, he loses faith. Mm. And I think that it's very important at the end of the day to maintain faith, you know, uh, in our fellow, you know, Americans, white, you know, and, and, and whatever, because, you know, if you don't do that, if, if, if you get into the trap of judging people because they're white as this, is putting them into this box, whatever the box may be, because they're white, then you're no better than the folks who are doing the same thing to you. And I think that's the thing that Malcolm forgets uh, during the course of the book. Yeah, your, your anger is righteous, and yeah, you've got a reason to be, to, to, to feel the way that you do. But the moment that you fall into that trap, you become the people that the you... The very thing that you, you hate. You become the thing that yeah. you hate. Yes. And, you know, that's, that, that's sort of the arc of his, of his story and of his life. Malcolm, don't, don't become this guy and you it, don't like. It ultimately ruined him uh, yeah. because... Yeah. Uh, and as you mentioned, mm -hmm. he ended up going off in this column mm -hmm. and he gets fired mm -hmm. <laughs> for mm -hmm. doing it uh, because uh, he also goes in to get it on because mm -hmm. they weren't going to put it out there. Mm -hmm. He actually hacks his boss's system, Bob, mm -hmm. and he puts it out there anyway. Yeah, Malcolm writes this very <laughs> inflammatory column yes. and all his bosses say, you know, when's the last time you had a vacation? <laughs> no, we're not, pub we're not publishing this ever, but, you know, you, you could probably use a vacation. And so he, he sneaks into the newspaper office uh, late that night and just, you know, presses a few buttons and hacks into his boss's computer and publishes it on the front page on, the, on election day. You know, so and, and, and it not yeah. only gets yeah. him fired, mm -hmm. but it sets off the races. Yeah, <laughs> who ultimately kidnap him who and, and him. just yeah. want to go a whole new route over <laughs> yeah, there. Exactly, <laughs> they, they got plans. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm setting this mm -hmm. up because I I do want to ask mm -hmm. you about how you develop your books when you're mm -hmm. writing. Is, is it the character first and then the plot? Mm -hmm. So don't. Don't go anywhere with that. Or okay. maybe you should. Maybe you should. Go should ahead. Answer answer it's usually yes. character first. It's usually it's char character. It's usually theme and character and then plot. A plot happens while I'm writing. I don't really sit down and, and come up with a plot. I used to try to do that and it never really worked. I think that's one of the reasons it took me so long to be able to sell a to sell a book. I had this this plot that I was trying to, you know, hammer, you know, pieces into. That's my problem. Really? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I That's the writer's block. <laughs> yeah, I used to read. Uh, all, I bought all these books on how to write a novel, mm -hmm. and I keep them to remind myself of how much money I wasted. <laughs> and I and then I read Stephen King's book on writing. Gotcha. Which is like the best book on writing I've, I've read. And he just he just said he just he just starts with the characters and you know maybe a few plot points or whatever, and then he just writes to find out what's going to happen. And once I allowed myself to write to find out what was going to happen, everything just sort of opened up and it became a lot easier. Wow, that's really mm -hmm. good. And speaking of character, mm -hmm. the ones you develop before you write, mm -hmm. I want to read to our listeners, our viewers, okay. uh, about one of the characters that okay. I found to be very interesting and very humorous. Okay. And uh, I don't have my glasses, so I'll, I'll try to read it. Um, there's about a paragraph here, page 46 of okay. Grant Park. Malcolm sighed as they returned to the computer. Tonight, what did that mean? What was happening tonight? He's just trying to figure out what's going to happen that mm -hmm. night. Then his gaze went to the window. The drunk was back, peering through where the glass brick should have been. Malcolm barred his teeth in frustration and anger. What are you waiting for? Do something. Find a cop. Get help. Mm -hmm. Still, the eyes registered nothing. After a long moment, the face slid down the wall and once again was gone. So here he was, a 60-year-old, Trust up in chains like Kunta Kinte, mm. at the mercy of two white supremacist lunatics and his salvation. If he was to be saved, rested in the hands of some homeless, hollowed eyed drunk. Malcolm heaved a soft, bitter sigh, marveling anew at the bizarre twist life can take. 
His life in particular, there had been so many sharp turns and switchbacks on the road that led from then till now. But the sharpest, and in hindsight, the most consequential had been one of the very first 40 years ago. 40 years it started. Mm -hmm. And so I'm hoping that I've already told our viewers and our listeners a little bit about the story to mm -hmm. where they know that this is a character that you're writing about. It's not Bob and it's not Malcolm. Mm -hmm. This is about a drunk. Yeah, Willie. Willie. Mm -hmm. And I found him very interesting because okay. he's a veteran mm -hmm. and he's kind of withered in life. Yeah. And he's gotten to this tithered place where he's like just off and about and he stumbles upon the Malcolm kidnapping. kidnapped yeah. in the room with yeah. the supremacist. Yeah. And Malcolm's wanting him to get help. Right. And he's just looking, I guess, startled, disbelief. Well, he's <laughs> like, they, they're holding him in this, uh, in this abandoned warehouse, and the drunk uses his warehouse to store his, um, his shopping cart full of his, you know, some, his stuff, his street stuff. So he's angry, you know, who are these people in there in my place? And then he looks in, and he sees Malcolm, as he says, trussed up like, like, like Kunta Kinte, and it sort of, it sort of stirs it within, within him, you know, okay, maybe I should do something, or maybe I shouldn't. You know, because it's not it's none of my business. Yeah. And, he, you know, he sort of deals with this, you know, this sort of ethical dilemma. At the same time, he's dealing with also the fact that he's got men, he's got severe mental illness, mental, you know, mental health problems. So also, you know, am I imagining all of this is, is, is all of this is all of this real? So Willie was I, I liked Willie because he brought a certain pathos. Uh, to 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 the story. There's, yeah, I think a lot of readers. I've, I've been told a lot of readers really root for for Willie, you know, to to have this last moment, this this mo this moment of heroism. He yes. used to, he he was a, he was a soldier. He fought in Vietnam. Uh, he was he was uh, you know he was a man with with responsibilities. He was a hero. And now forty some years later, he's this guy who's living on the street, you know, with undiagnosed mental health problems. So this is sort of, on top of everything else, this is his chance to redeem himself yes. and that's what he comes to see it as in, in his own mind this is my chance to redeem myself this is my chance to to to, to become somebody again and he attempts to help yeah. he, he attempts to he ends up attempting to, to help uh, get uh, get Malcolm free and he ends up dead I wasn't gonna say that but okay <laughs> <laughs> the reason why I'm just gonna tell that part uh -huh. of it and maybe I should have found a more climactic way no, of not it's, saying it's, it. It's all good. But the reason why mm -hmm. I told that part of the story mm -hmm. is because he survived the war mm -hmm. to die there. Yeah, he survived. Trying to be a hero. He still. survives the war, but he ends up, you know, not being able to survive. Uh, you know, trying to save Malcolm. But he also, but he, but he goes. He he achieves the goal of going out a hero. Yes, you know, he, he does. He definitely goes out a hero. I get that. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, and I love some of the other characters, and we yeah. won't go into all of them. But okay. I just wanted to give our viewers just an opportunity to hear how you're developing these characters yeah. and the background that they bring to the story, and how that gets woven into the whole big picture. Well, as I said, I, you know, I don't do a whole lot of plotting beforehand, and Willie wasn't even there when I first started writing. <laughs> I didn't know Willie was going to be there, and then Willie just sort of popped up, and I said, "Well, let's see where he goes. Let's see what he does." Mm -hmm. and that, that's how he ended up being what he was. That's amazing. That's 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 true talent. That's got to be talent. <laughs> that's, just, that's just having fun. That's just, you know, <laughs> oh, let's put a drunk at the window and see what he does. You know, and I mm -hmm. just followed Willie and see what, what would happen with Willie. Mm -hmm. So, so um, I, I, you when you write your books like Grant Park, mm -hmm. um, you've written some others, right. uh, Freeman. Freeman uh, and Before I Forget. Before I Forget, mm -hmm. you've written one to you, your son. Yes. No, I wrote Becoming Dad, which Becoming is a book about dad. black men and fatherhood. Okay. Becoming Dad, yeah. When I, I want to just kind of give you, because you're mm. kind of all over the place, mm. and it's easy, I guess, for you to do to some degree right. because you can be more opinionated. Mm. Um, so we're going to tap into some of that opinion okay. um, mindset, and then I'll come back to one of your columns that I love. Okay. Um, when you hear Confederate flag. <laughs> Your opinion. When I hear Confederate flag, I, I've never had the guts to walk up to one of those folks and say, you know, I, I usually put my, my used tissue in the trash, but if that's what you want to do, wear it on your shirt, then be my guest. <laughs> Which okay. Slam <laughs> it's kind of dunk. You. you know, I okay. think that, you know, I, the whole issue of the Confederate flag is, is, is such, is so fake. I, every argument they make, it's heritage, not history, not, not, not hate. Yeah, the heritage is hate. You know, next step, 
I mean, the, the, the flag only came back into popular use in the late 50s and early 60s as a means of expressing resistance to the civil rights movement. You know, in America, we live by what a historian uh, has called uh, these sort of civic myths. We have these myths, these, these lies, basically, that we have chosen to believe, which actually have no bearing on what actually happened in the, in, in the country. So, you know, people say heritage, not, not, not hate, and I'm sure that they think that, that they're, they're saying something, but the actual historical record does not support that. You know, we, we're, in, in, we're in the midst of this, this period of revisionism where suddenly the slavery had nothing to do with the Civil War. And the problem with that, again, if you look at the facts, is that every, you know, uh, duh. All, all, when the states <laughs> left, they said, y'all ain't taking our slaves. They basically said that. Mississippi said our position is thoroughly identified with slavery, the greatest material, uh, I think wealth was, was the word, greatest material wealth or, or whatever mm -hmm. it, 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 on, on the planet. The vice president of the Confederacy said, our new government is founded on the great truth that the Negro is inferior to the white man, the slavery, subordination to the superior races is natural, you know, place to be. So it's like, there's no, there's no mystery here except to the degree that we need to believe there's a mystery here so that people can continue waving that silly flag or bowing at those pigeon stained statues. And I don't have a lot of respect for it either. You go. I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry. I think that's what, what's really, you know, a, it's, you're living a lot of people's dreams to yeah. be able to get paid to have your opinion, opinion. about these yeah. things because y you're not straddling racism and you're not straddling any of the, the social issues and things. You're just telling it like it is from both sides, no matter who gets kind of popped yeah. or, or, or <laughs> stroked or I however that, it goes. That's the job description. If, right. you, if you write a column and, and nobody's mad with you, you know, you probably didn't do a good, very good column. <laughs> Every once in a while, there's one that everybody will like. Okay, yeah, you write a column. Yeah, I, I love mom and apple pie. Yeah, you know, Mr. Pitts, and, and I've never agreed with you before, but I agree with you now. And Leonard, you've mm -hmm. had some controversial columns where your Just life few. has been threatened. Yeah, back in 07, uh, there was a uh, the, the little, you know, dust up, I guess, with, with some supposed neo-Nazis and, and, and whatever. But and it was at the moment, it was, you know, sort of this great disruption, this great trauma in my life, but what I came to realize, matter of fact, that's what I got the uh, the, um, the NABJ's uh, Journalist of the Year Award, and what I said in accepting it was that I came to realize that what for me was this great trauma for Medgar Evers was Tuesday. You know, it was any given Tuesday. Mm -hmm. And when you come to really think about it like that, that's then you deep. say, you know, yeah. whatever. Okay, moving on. Moving on. Another two words mm -hmm. for your opinion. Okay. Fake news. <laughs> <laughs> um, what comes to mind? There's, what comes to mind is the the sort of facts optional America that we find ourselves living in, uh, led by our, our lamentable president, uh, under which people can, you know, label as quote unquote fake news anything that they don't like, not because it's untrue or inaccurate or quote unquote fake, but because they don't like it. And what's amazing about that. One, it's ridiculous that, that people in supposed positions of responsibility, like the president, can say this. But what's even more ridiculous and frankly frightening is that so many Americans listen to this and go, uh-huh, yeah, fake news. And I, you know, I get, I get- And they believe it. And they believe it. I get challenged by readers a lot. Mr. Pitch, you lie. Okay, here's the piece. Show me what I said that was inaccurate. Mm -hmm. I never hear from them again. Because it's not about me being untrue or, 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 or inaccurate, rather. It's about them not liking what I said. Yes. And the, the fact that you don't like a fact doesn't mean it's, it's, fake. Not, it's not a fact. <laughs> you know, I don't like the right. fact that my, that my hair is gone. But guess yes. what? It's a fact. Hello. You know, got to <laughs> got to live with it or get some was it Rogaine or whatever that stuff is, you know, or just or just live with it. But you can't, you know, you, I can't walk can't around. Can't negate the truth. I can't walk around with a comb going like this. You know, people yeah. look at me like I'm a fool. The the truth yeah. is what the truth is. Yes. You know. I, I get you. Um, I, it doesn't help, I guess, mm -hmm. that you do have a few journalists here and there that mm -hmm. will come on and embellish the news and, and people, do some yeah, things. And th who, there's a little yeah. of every, every, there's a little bad in everything, right? The problem is, you know, journalism draws its its workers from the human race. That's its, that's its workforce. Hello. So as long as the, <laughs> long as long as human beings are involved in it, it's going to be imperfect. You're going to get Jason Blair. You're going to get Brian Williams on occasion. You're going to get this kind of stuff happening. But the thing is that any responsible news organization, when it when that happens, 
what's the first thing they do? They own up to it. They say, this is how the mistake happened, and these are the steps we're putting in place to make sure it doesn't happen again. Oh, and this is how we punish the person that, that did this. Hmm. And that's all you can really ask for anybody to do. Everybody is going to make mistakes. I've made errors of fact. Everybody I know has made errors of fact. But what you do is you say, that was an error of fact. This is how I made it. You know, I apologize, and we'll, you know, we'll human try to, error. We'll try I mean, to it happens. Yeah. Sorry. That, that, that's not fake news. That's called human beings. Yes. <laughs> you I know? like that. Yeah. Uh, just a few more. Shoot. Um, a word to my sisters. What would your words to your sisters be? Any, you know, just what would you say? Um, this, this climate that we women live in, a word, an <laughs> opinion. Well, it depends on how we define a sister. If we define a sister as, as women in general or as, or as African-American women, to African-American women, I would say thank you. Uh, and, uh, and I would hope that we as African-American men are going to be, uh, and I think we are starting to be, a little bit more, a little bit more uh, proactive in taking care of our share of the family load. I remember that Bill Cosby gave a speech some years ago talking about, you know, sisters need to do this and sisters need to do that because, you know, men aren't there, et cetera. And what I've come to realize, and I've heard some women say this, some black women say this, that they get tired of this whole, I'm a strong black woman thing. Why do I have to always be strong? You know, yeah. why can't I just be a human being? And I think that there's some there's some a whole lot of truth to that. And I think when that, in fact, biblically, yeah. I'm supposed to be the weaker. Yeah. So <laughs> I two. think, yeah I, th yeah, I think that, you know, I think that we need to uh, sort of get past that. And I'm, I'm you know, I, I really am sorry for for for, for no problem. To the degree I that men, I ask no, you I'm sorry it. to the degree that men. I'm sorry to the degree that men have, have, have you know, black men have contributed to that. We're, we're to coming women, to them. We're coming. We're getting there. To women in general. <laughs> yes. You know, as I look at this sort of, you know, we're seeing this this rise of of, of, of open racism. We're also seeing a very big rise of open misogyny. You know, we talk about sexism and it sort of this, has a sound of this sort of abstract word to it, this sort of abstract feel to it. But I'm seeing women threatened, particularly online, I'm seeing women threatened, you know, in, in very spe gender specific sexual violence type of ways. And I've had this happen to a number of my, journal my women journalist friends. Uh, I'm, I'm seeing this sort of this, this, this hatefulness uh, going on, you know, toward women that really embarrasses me as a man mm. and, and really just makes me, makes me very angry. So I guess I'd say I'm sorry to them, too. <laughs> Word to my brothers. Word to my brothers, step up, you know, step up. And that, that goes for, for brothers of, of whatever, whatever color. Step, you know, step all the way up. Um, there's, a, there's a speech that I used to give where I talked about the uses of men's, of men's strength. Because, mm -hmm. you know, we, we are of our toughness, of our physical toughness. And, um, you know, because we, we're always very proud to be able to, you know, to, to as men, we, we want to crow and, and have this bravado about how physically tough we are. But what I've come to understand is that toughness doesn't mean anything. And toughness is defined by what toughness is, is used in service of. And the, the example that I use is my um, middle son, who during a blizzard with the snow up to his, uh, you know, to his, to his waist, I called him one time. I'm stuck in the same snowstorm. I'm in Kansas. Uh, he's in Maryland. And I call him and I ask him, what's he doing? And he's, he's huffing and puffing. Well, what's, what's wrong? Son? Why are you huffing and puffing? I'm walking to the store to get some diapers for my baby. And I'm like, that's what a man's supposed to do. <laughs> you know, he used his toughness in the service of making sure his baby was okay. Mm -hmm. And that to me is what, is what a lot of us as men, that's, we need to take from that example. Yeah, you're tough. Yeah, you're big. Yeah, you're bad. What does that, what purpose does that serve? Does it serve the purpose of anchoring your community and, and, and saving your, your, your family and, and, and your kids? Or does it just serve the purpose of, you know, blowing off some steam at the bar? Gotcha. Yeah. I love also, Leonard, that mm -hmm. you don't just talk about the problems mm -hmm. and have an opinion about them. Yeah. You talk about the solutions. And in one of your columns in 2007, mm -hmm. you actually solicited people to be a part of the process what of works. the solutions. Yeah. What works? Yeah. Tell us about that. And what was the response to it? The response was pretty huge. We had like, uh, I guess, about a th over a thousand emails or something like that. What works was a series of columns that I did uh, in which I asked readers to point to programs around the country that are having success in turning around the lives of at-risk kids. Uh, and I was pointed to, uh, to programs. I went to Portland, Oregon. Uh, it was one up in Baltimore, uh, Miami, Atlanta, all of these places. And what I came, I, I probably did about 12, 13 columns in the, in the series, something like that. And what I came to understand is that there's no, it's not rocket science. 
you know, th there's, a, there's a certain number, there's a certain few principles that, that kept coming through, smaller class sizes, and, and show kids that you, that, that you care about them and have mental health, uh, you know, professionals available for kids who are really going through stuff and allow, uh, you know, hold teachers more accountable, allow, um, allow principals more say in who's hired and who's fired and, you know, less television. I mean, all these, you know, stuff just, just started, you know, starting to be the same. And what it, what I came to understand is that we don't we don't it's not that we don't know how to save our kids it's not that we lack the 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 um, way it's that we lack the will you know nobody we 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 actually just haven't done it but the the roadmaps are there the roadmaps are in Atlanta with the um, with the um, Eastgate Foundation they're in, they're in Harlem with the Harlem Children's Zone they're in Miami with the 500 uh, uh, role models of excellence they're all over the place so it's just you know we need to take what's working in those programs and. My, my frustration is that the, we've sort of made this thing sort of a Russian roulette for kids, so that uh, or a game of chance for kids, so that if you live in the right place and, and and you get into one of these programs, you might be okay. But if you live in a in a bad neighborhood that doesn't it's not served by one of these programs, mm. you're in trouble. And it, I think that a kid should have the right to to expect that wherever I live, I'm going to have a decent shot at you know, doing something with my life. And it's just, that is just not the case right now. We got your public opinion about that. Yeah, yes, ma'am. <laughs> Moving on to politics and uh -oh. press responsibility. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, because you wrote about it. Uh-huh, what I say, what I say. <laughs> well, I'm asking you what you mm -hmm. say. You, um, mm -hmm. you wrote about, um, well, I, I think the thing here is, is that you do lectures. You mm -hmm. do a series of lectures, and you get an opportunity to talk mm -hmm. about all sorts of things. And, the, and I, I won't go in depth with this per se, but I think it just lends itself to, we do have a responsibility as journalists. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, that that doesn't change no matter what mm -hmm. to be objective mm -hmm. uh, in our in our what we do um, and I think that's what you're kind of calling for is for us to be able to do that mm -hmm. but you know tell it tell the truth tell it like it is well too. see yeah I, I never use the word objective because objective means without without emotion and, I, and again we're talking about human beings so as mm -hmm. long as there's human beings there's going to be human emotion there's going to be human judgment I, I say and with you know, and I know this has become a cliche and an advertising slogan, but what I say that we need to be is not objective because we never will. We need to be fair and balanced. You know, we need we need to tell both sides of, of, of whatever the story is, but we also need to understand that there is a there is a time and there is a place for us as journalists slash human beings to have judgment. When the people in Charlottesville, you know, came to when they when they came to Charlottesville with their little tiki torches, you know, to to demonstrate, I'm sorry, there were not two sides to that story. With all due res with no due respect to the president, there, yes. there were not two sides to that story. There were people who were out there spreading and preaching hate and there were people who were out there not. And so, you know, and I and I don't expect any journalist to to sort of treat this as to treat that as if it's a two sided as if it's a two sided story. One group clearly has the moral high ground; the other has the moral sewer. And you know so that that's that's it's when, clearly yeah, one side. I it's mean, clearly. there's no there, way to look at it any other way. There used to be an editor who, <laughs> when, when at the Miami Herald, who when when young writers were young reporters were you know going overboard with this, well, I've got to be balanced, I've got to be objective. He said, so what? Five minutes for Hitler, five minutes for the Jews. Wow. Yeah, and it's like when you think about it like that, you say, yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> there is a place for me to have human judgment here. Right. Yeah. I'm, and I'm glad that you do that. And you yeah. do it right there. Yeah. Uh, Leonard Pitts, mm -hmm. Jr., uh, you wrote this one, American repudiates its president. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a, a lot of the yeah. um, cabinet members stepping down Yeah. and that sort of thing. How yeah. do we feel about that? What's your opinion about what's going on with uh, the White House? I think that this is the longest. Uh, <laughs> this is the longest seven or eight months in the history of time, and it really is depressing to me to think that we're not yet a quarter of the way through uh, this this debacle. I think that the president is clearly incompetent, clearly mendacious, clearly a narcissistic white supremacist bore. If I may be, you know, just 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 blunt about Those it. Those are the opinions of, of Leonard Pitts Jr. Jr. Not reflecting. Yeah, no. well, you don't reflect the, the opinions of this me. statement That's or the right. management. No, the president is not a good person. He is not. A, he is fundamentally not a good person. And I think that we. I, I think that in, in 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 a very real sense, we are operating without a president right now. 
I mean, we got this guy in office, yeah, but we've got we've got so many positions in the government that are not filled. We have so much stuff that needs to be done or decided that is not being done or decided. In a fundamental way, we're operating without a president in this country right now, mm -hmm. and I think it's I think this is the scariest period. I think it's the scariest period since the 1850s. I'm trying to think, you know, maybe maybe some era in the Cold War or or, or the or the Great Depression, the Second World War, but it's right up there with those. Our it's, time is yeah. flying. We only have a few minutes left, okay. but I want to uh, just do this right mm -hmm. quick. I want to go back to something I opened up on our United States mm -hmm. or anything but, and the two quotes that we talked about Dr. from Martin King Luther and, King, King, yeah. uh, and, and, and Obama, and Obama yeah. 40 years different, and what you're talking about right now, and mm -hmm. that's why this came back to mind to me mm -hmm. so that I can get back to some of your writing. Okay. Um, so you say, so it can, and relatively easily at that, for Russia, Cuba, North Korea, and China to change would require a coup, mm -hmm. blood running in the streets. Mm -hmm. We, on the other hand, can transfigure a nation through the simple expedient of a ballot. Mm -hmm. America is a state of constant reinvention, which is reason to hope this secession is not the end of the story, reason to hope we return this country to some semblance of itself, reason to hope but not guarantee. All we have is a fighting chance, but America has never needed more than that. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's That was my uh, Independence Day column for this year for 2017. Yeah. That, that, that's quite an opinion there. Yeah. How do you feel about America being great again? <laughs> Just ask. <him. laughs> no, because when you say that, I'm, I'm thinking of, of the, the, the we're, Trump we're slogan, and I think America was 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 great uh, before. I think America had problems, but I think America was great before. I, the, the whole problem with "Make America Great Again" is that it's it's coded language for "Let's take America back from this black guy in the White House." If you want to be perfectly honest, that that's what "Make America Great Again" meant. And uh, that's why I've, I've always found that problematic. I think that for America to be great, it has to first be good. And I don't think at this point, let me take that back. As you look at Houston and you see a lot of people, you know, these, these strangers, you know, putting themselves out to, to, to help out, to help strangers and everybody, you know, sort of reaching out to, 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 other, to other people. The, the seed of that goodness is still there and it perhaps will always be there, but it is not encouraged, it is not trumpeted, it is not validated from the highest levels of American governance. And that has to change before we're ever gonna you know, be anything like what we're supposed to be. Gotcha. I think that you are, mm -hmm. among all the words that we've described you in the top of the mm -hmm. show, are wordsmith. I can't, Thank you. can't say that enough. I know that <laughs> some might say wordsmith, but I, <laughs> wordsmith. I think it's wordsmith, yeah. <laughs> it's, you're, 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 you're really very versed, and people don't know mm -hmm. that your background includes being a historian. So you, you are pretty much up on our past when yeah. you talk about it t enough to know our history. In, and in your opinion, where we're going yeah, for our I'm, future. I'm, a, I'm more of a history buff than a historian, but yeah, you know, I, I read a lot of, a lot of history because what I've come to understand is you, you, can't, uh, you can't know where you are unless you know where you've been, and people are really resistant to that. They, they, they're very happy if you tell them the myths, but they don't really want to deal with the history, and the reason that they don't want to deal with the history is because the history makes us feel bad and especially our racial history. Now, this goes for, for African Americans and, and whites. For African Americans, a lot of times there's a resistance to this history because it's gonna make me angry, it's gonna make me feel bad. For white Americans, there's a resistance because it's gonna make me feel guilty or it's gonna make me feel like you're trying to make me feel guilty. And my thing is, history doesn't exist history doesn't care about your feelings and history doesn't exist for your feelings. History exists to tell you how we got this way. And if you wanna understand how we got this way and correspondingly how we can go from here to someplace better, you have to understand that. You have to figure out the, the, the you know, you have to figure out your history. What's, we know your history. Yeah. So what's your future? What's next for Leonard Pitts? Lord, no, it, well, I'm gonna continue writing columns and putting out, uh, and putting out novels until, until they tell me I can't do <laughs> one or the other of those things. <laughs> you know, I, you, you, you mentioned at the, at the beginning the, the whole thing about I'm a writer, period, and that's what I've always, yeah, that's how I've always. That's all I've ever wanted to really be professionally, uh, is, is to just be, is to just write. So as long as they'll let me do that, and they're, they're still paying me for that, then I'm doing it. And, and doing it well. Well, thank uh, you. You know, that's just my opinion. I appreciate <laughs> it. I, I, I agree with your opinion. <laughs> so yeah. let me ask you this: mm -hmm. Who do you 
look up to? Is that is there a look up to type thing? I know for me, per I'll just say mm -hmm. it like this. For me personally as a journalist, mm -hmm. I don't think that I really had anybody that I per se looked mm -hmm. up to. I was kind of like me, fi me always. Right. It's just kind of like that, but I don't know. What, I don't what think about there's you? any particular journalist. Okay. Um, there's journalists I enjoy. Okay. Um, I, I guess Nick Kristoff. Yeah, I, I like I like what he does. Uh, Connie Schultz, Kathleen Parker. These are people. I don't know if look up to is the right word. But these are people. I gotcha. whose, These are people whose work I respect a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, even George Will. Uh, you know, there's there's a lot of people whose whose work I respect a lot because it shows craft, you know, mastery of the craft, and it also shows thought. And those are the two things that I think that are are, are necessary if you're going to if you're going to be a, be worth reading at least for me right. as as a journalist. Right. And, and I think look up to got caught up in your thought yeah. process yeah. because you're not on my little inky dinky. No. Little, you're the wordsmith, so you were looking for the. the right. well, yeah, okay, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Uh, mm. wh what were, I don't want to make you have mm. to say your favorite in all of your mm. writings, um, mm. i.e., it could be your columns or mm. it could be one of your novels. But what. I'm, you poured a little heart and soul, I'm sure, in all yeah. of it, but was there one that you just could look back and say, that was good? My favorite thing I've ever written is my novel, Freeman. Mm. That's over 40 years now. My favorite thing is Freeman, and it's my favorite thing because it, when you write, um, you have this this, image, this thing in your head, this, this sound, this feeling in your head, and what, what comes out on the page Sometimes it's only 80% of that, sometimes it's 90, sometimes, oh my God, it's only 60%. What was I thinking when I did this? Freeman's like one of the only things that I've done that is 100% what I had in my head. So I feel like it's, you know, it, 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 was, it was successful for me in, in that, that regard. And that was to tell a story, that was, yeah. a love story. Yeah, Freeman's a novel about a former slave who uh, walks across the country at the end of the Civil War looking for his wife. Yeah. And I love that too, and, yeah. and of the idea that you had behind writing that, although yeah. I know with the way you do it in your style, mm -hmm. is to develop the characters. Right. <laughs> I let them tell me who they are. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So in just thinking about mm -hmm. the style that you have um, come about and, mm -hmm. and works for you, what do you say to, uh, I don't want to say aspiring writers, because I've heard your opinion on that. <laughs> <laughs> Darn, she, she almost <laughs> fell into my trap. <laughs> almost, no. <laughs> so, but what uh -huh. would you say to someone who, who probably has picked up the pen mm -hmm. and written and probably put it down for various reasons? If you're able, I, this is going to be, be harsh, almost as harsh as what I tell aspiring writers, which is don't aspire. But if you're able, if I'm able to discourage you from writing, then you probably should be discouraged from writing. If you're able to put down that pen and not pick it up again, then maybe there's a reason that you should. I write because I got no, I have no choice. My friend Tanana Reeve Du uh, had this great answer once when somebody asked her, somebody tell, told her, I want to write, and she says, don't bother. Because if all you have is, I want to write, then you're probably not going to have enough stick to to deal with it when the writing is bad or when it gets rejected or when you're not getting paid or whatever. If you have a need to write, then you're already writing. And that, to me, is, 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 is the key for a lot of it. I, you know, I, I need to do this. I, I, I mean that's it. That's the bottom line. So people, people who 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 tell me that you know I, I want to write, it's like aspiring writers. You know. Okay. What about what about that writer who's the perfectionist? We all and just, are. You know, you just there's no such thing. But I'm just saying. No. Nope. <laughs> but but yeah. it's never good enough for you to. to Sometimes get it perfectionism off the... is fear. Yes. Sometimes okay. perfectionism is failure. Yeah. Fear failure. Fear of failure or fear that this is not going to be what I want it to be. And deadlines I've found are wonderful for concentrating that. Mm -hmm. uh, deadlines, whether it's coming from the newspaper in my, in my day job or whether it's just self-imposed, I've got to have this book by such and such time, have a way of concentrating you and, and making you stop gazing at your navel and just going ahead and, and <laughs> just going ahead and doing it. That's why I said I've had to learn to live with Okay, this is eighty percent of what I what I had in my head. This is ninety percent. Right. Because sometimes that's that's what you're going to be able to get Do in the time allowed. Do you ever think of your audience first? Who am I talking to? What is the story that I want them to leave? Not when I'm done. I usually think about what it, what what the I, my first thought is usually to the story. What is it I'm trying to say? What is it that I'm trying to convey? The only time I think about the audience is if I'm, I'm about to use language that may not be familiar 
to the whole audience. If I'm about to use some black slang or something like that, you know, uh, okay, is this something that, that the whole audience is going to be able to understand or at least infer the meaning of? That's when I think of the audience. Other than that, I'm thinking more of what's the best thing I can do to tell whatever this is that's in my head. Mm -hmm. So you're on um, a book tour with Grant Park and or a lecture series or what are we doing these no, days? No, I'm just, I'm just speaking right now. And we love to hear you so I'm you know we're going to be <laughs> knocking speaking. at your door to get you to come and, and, yeah. and say something. Uh. Do you have any closing remark or something? How do you want to be remembered? What is your, <laughs> what, what would you like to, to, oh my to Lord, always the, have out there about the, Leonard If I Pitt's could come Jr. back as a tree question, I wasn't <laughs> expecting that one. Oh. Didi, you're so much better than that as a journalist, <laughs> and I'm just kidding. I'm just trying to move you to the point where I just want to end our AWARE show um, on a note with you that just speaks to who you are, what you do, and what we can continue to expect from you. I would just like to be remembered as a good writer who, who who was never quite content with his own with his own work who always strove to to be better and along the way maybe said something that was of value to somebody somewhere at some time and probably told somebody else's story and probably told somebody else's story multifaceted all in there yeah, together yeah that too that too that too <laughs> Because that's what I see in yeah. your work. Well, thank you. Okay. Well, no, thank you. And uh, I just hope that you'll continue to keep up all this good work. Yes, ma'am. And that uh, it'll continue to generate uh, the type of uh, feedback that you've gotten. I understand one one column got over 30,000 uh, yeah, people riled up. Yeah, that's the uh, September 12th column. Yeah. yeah. So we're we just uh, here on Aware. Yeah. Continue to wish you much success. Thank you. Appreciate and thank you for it. dropping by our studio it's and honoring pleasure. us with this wonderful interview. Oh, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> thank you. All right. You take care. All right. You too. All right. A passionate writer who tells it like it is, and you just heard him, Leonard Pitts Jr., speaks truth to power. His books are a must read. You cannot put them down once you start. I can attest to that. His columns are thought provoking, they make you want to act get involved, and he is one of the most influential writers of our time. As one professor puts it, his voice is not only of this generation, but generations past and future. This has been an Aware Profile. I'm Dee Dee Sharp, glad you joined us. Until the next time, stay informed and stay aware.